Praise the Lord. We're so excited to share the Word of God with you on this wonderful Sunday morning. Thank you so much for gathering with us. Pastor Samantha and I send our love, our prayers, and we're so thankful to be able to share with you today. Praise the Lord. God has a great message in store for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege we have to share the treasures of the Word of God. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for grace deposits, truth impartations in our life. We thank you, Lord, that you give us revelation of your word. Help us to see areas of our life where we can grow, where we can apply your word so that we can become like you and be used by you to the greatest and maximum level. Father, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way today, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to read a verse there. But we've been talking about keys to running your race. And today I want to talk about another important aspect that's really critical when it comes to running our race. Something that if we don't really focus on, then it can actually uh, stop us. It can stop us dead in our tracks from finishing the race that God has for us. So we want to talk about it. But before we get into it, let's look at 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. The Bible says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, notice this, measuring themselves by themselves, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, notice this, are not wise. It's not wise to compare yourself, right? It's what Paul, the Apostle Paul is trying to say. And you know, when you look at that <laughs> verse, uh, it's probably not one that we hear preached a lot. <clears throat> but I tell you what, it's one that we live in a, it's one that applies to the day because we live in a comparison centered world. People compare everything in this world in which we live. People compare houses, people compare cars, people compare spouses, people compare their kids, right? People compare their professions, right? Almost every conceivable thing that you can talk about, people compare. And you know what? I wish I could say that that comparison ended at the doors of the church, but it does not, right? Even in the church, people compare preachers. Well, I like this preacher, and I like this preacher, and I don't like this preacher, and I don't like that preacher, right? People compare choirs. People compare uh, worship leaders. People compare youth ministers. Uh, people compare churches. People compare suits and skinny jeans. <laughs> people compare... Uh, clothing and all different types of things, even in the house of God. People compare, you know, the inside decorations of church, the outside structures of churches. People compare everything, right? And, you know, certainly that's true of kids, right? Kids compare clothing, physical uh, attributes, athletic ability, all those types of things. But I want to read that verse to you again because it's so applicable for our lives and today. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise, are not wise. Now, God says comparison, com you know, getting into comparison is not wise. So why does he say that? Well, there's two primary reasons. Number one, <clears throat> if someone has more or better than I do, then it can lead me to depression. I guess I am. Or it can lead me to jealousy. I'm jealous about what they got, right? Uh, the second thing that's negative is if I have better or more than somebody else has, then it can lead me to pride. Well, look at me. I'm good, right? I'm all that and a bag of chips and dip and Diet Coke on the side, right? No, God doesn't want any of those things in our life, right? And so comparing uh, comparison is not something that is productive. Matter of fact, God says it's not wise to do it, right? And so we want to talk about um, some key elements of running our race. And why do I bring up, you know, comparing themselves and comparing themselves and blah, blah, blah. You know, people do a lot of comparison, but really when it comes down to the things of God, God only looks at a few areas of our life um, that makes distinction between us and other people. Um, there's only a few things that really are important in the eyes of God that make a distinction between us and other people. There are things that we can measure our own life with. 
And one of them is very important when it comes to running our race, and that is your character. See, <clears throat> people's character is different. Like we talk about comparison and things like that. People's character is very different. <clears throat> uh, let me just give you a, uh, some obvious differences in character. You can have one person who's honest and what? A person who's dishonest, right? You can have another person who's humble. And then conversely, you can have somebody who's prideful and arrogant. You can have somebody who's kind. You can have somebody who's mean. You can have somebody who's generous. You can have somebody who's stingy, right? You can have somebody who's good. You can have somebody who's evil. You can have somebody who's active. They're proactive. They get things done. They don't wait. Then you can have somebody that's passive. They procrastinate, right? You can have somebody that's bold, somebody that's timid. You can have somebody that's compassionate. You can have somebody that's uncaring. You can have somebody that's dependable. And then you can have somebody that's unreliable, right? You can have somebody that's grateful or ungrateful, loyal or disloyal. You can have somebody who's patient. You can have somebody who's impatient. You can have somebody who's punctual. You can have someone who's always tardy. You can have someone who's self-controlled. You can have somebody who's out of control. You can have somebody who's sincere. You can have somebody who's artificial. You can have somebody who's holy. You can have somebody who's profane. You can have somebody that's truthful. You can have a liar. You can have somebody who's stubborn. And you can have somebody who's teachable. I think if you look at all the positive characteristics we just talked about, those are things that God wants to work into our lives, but they don't just happen. It takes us pursuing them. It takes us identifying character traits that we need to eradicate out of our life. It takes us identifying character traits that we need to integrate into our life and doing the things necessary to develop that character because good character must be developed. You know, I thank God for laying on of hands and there's a lot of things laying on of hands. The Bible tells us to lay hands on people for we lay hands on people to minister healing, the healing power of God, and pray for the sick. We lay hands on people to set up support people for the work of the ministry. <clears throat> we can lay hands on people for a multitude of different reasons. But one of the things we can't lay hands on people for is for character development, right? You can, we should pray for it, but it also takes work on our part. We have to renew our mind. We have to discipline the flesh. We have to value the things of the Spirit of God and the good character. We have to create actions on a regular basis that create habits so that that becomes a part of who we are, not who we were. Praise the Lord. And so <clears throat> let me show you another scripture with you. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, the Bible says, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. You know, we share this verse with our children Bad company corrupts good character, but it's the same principle is true for adults. Who you hang around is who you become. One person said, if you show me what you're reading and you show me who you're hanging around with, I'll show you who you'll be in five years, right? The company that you run with makes a difference in your life. That's why it's important to be in the house of God and connected to people that are heading in the right direction, right? They have the same core values that can encourage you to good works. And so the Bible tells us bad company corrupts good character. <clears throat> well, the reverse is also true. Good company, right, instills good values in people. Good company instills good values in people. And we listed all those good values earlier. But when we're talking about character, see, character is so vital when it comes to running our race because there's lots of people who are called. There are lots of people who are anointed. There are lots of people who are gifted but they never fulfilled the purpose. Why? Because their character caused suicide. Not physical suicide, but suicide of purpose, suicide of destiny, right? Bad character. There are lots of people in the Bible that their character destroyed them. They had a call. They had gifts. God had a plan for their life, but ultimately their bad character cost them. We can name just a few people. Judas, Judas laid hands on the sick. Judas was one of the 12 disciples, but greed got him. Uh, Saul, King Saul, called, anointed, right? 
Pride got it, right? Samson, same thing, lust got it, right? See, if you don't work on your character, your anointing can take you places that your character will not keep you. Your anointing, your calling, your giftings can take you to places that your character will not keep you. That's why it's vital to work on your character. And you can see now the connection is so important when it comes to running your race and finishing the race that God has for you. Now, let's talk a little bit about character because what is character? Well, character uh, is who you are when no one's looking, right? Because we can all have a you know, facade or an image or things like that. But who are you when nobody's looking? Who are you? Who, uh, character is who you are in the dark, right? When nobody's paying attention, when nobody's looking. See, reputation is, is uh, what people think about you, but character is who you really are. Your reputation is what people think about you, whether that's true or not. But character is who you really are, right? Character is made by what you stand for. Character is made by what you stand for. Reputation is made by what you fall for, right? Think about that. Character is made by what you stand for. What do you stand up for? What do you stand for, right? Is it truth? Is it honesty? Is it righteousness, right? But reputation, <laughs> I, you know, you, what, what did you fall for, right? Because that will label you, right? I like something a minister D.O. Moody said one time. He said, character is what you are in the dark. Character is what you are in the dark. And see, so your character and the development are, of your character are important to God. And your character, think of it like this, your character is either going to represent God or the enemy. You know, all those things we talked about, honest, dishonesty, you know, greed and generosity, all those types of things, they're, 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 that's pretty much characteristics of God. God is generous. God is loving. God is truthful. God is righteous. God is just. The enemy is selfish. The enemy is a liar. The enemy is a deceiver, right? So your character, the character that you exhibit is either going to exhibit characteristics of God or characteristics of the enemy, right? That's why we want to grow in God, develop character. And the reality is, all of us need character work. How do you know if you need character work? Are you breathing? <laughs> Are you still living? <clears throat> Nobody has reached the height of perfection when it comes to character, right? We're all a work in progress. And so God wants us to develop our character. He wants us to become like Christ. He wants us to think like Christ, to respond like Christ, to have the same priorities as Christ. And when we develop our character, then we get in position to fulfill our purpose and the blessings of God come on us because we are following God's will, right? Let's look at Romans 8, verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29. The Bible says, this is a New Living Translation. It says, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. Did you know that you are chosen to become like Christ? Listen, not just to know Christ, to become like Christ. God wants you to become like Christ so that his son would be the firstborn among, among many brothers. I want to read 2 Corinthians 3.18 in the message uh, paraphrase, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And it says, and so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives, listen to this, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. It is God's will for you to become like him. It is God's destiny for you to become like him. It's God's plan for you to become like him. The question is, are you doing what's necessary to become like him? See, working on your character is necessary for sustained kingdom use. Working on your character is necessary for sustained kingdom use. Now, we can see character all through the Bible, but one of the probably most visible spots as the apostle Paul was writing to his son Timothy in the Lord and the church that Timothy was pastoring was the church at Ephesus is a very large church and Timothy was experiencing lots of growth and he needed to install some leadership to help him so he wrote to Paul and asked him what are the qualifications of leadership and then Paul wrote to him first Timothy chapter chap the first Timothy but we're going to focus on chapter three because here uh, God has given us some character traits of those who want to be in church leadership and characteristics we could say of this, like this 
of mature Christian people. So let's look at 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read this to you from the New King James Translation. It says, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, <clears throat> sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, at least being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, many times people read over this and they just disregard this whole passage because it says, if anyone desires to be a bishop, well, they say, well, I don't want to be a bishop. I'm not called to be a bishop. Well, really what it's talking about is when you're talking about people to select to help with church leadership, when you're talking about selecting people that are spiritually mature, these really can be defined as the marks of maturity. What are some of the character traits of a mature Christian? And so he begins to talk about them. And actually, uh, the message translation or paraphrase actually says that in 1 Timothy 3, it says, if anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, who do we look for? And so I want to point out, as we look at this passage, I want to point out something very interesting. When Paul was writing this to Timothy about selecting leaders and to help in the church, I want you to notice what is glaringly missing. Paul said nothing about looking for people that were anointed. <laughs> I just blew some religious blood, bu popped some religious bubbles, right? Paul said nothing for looking for somebody that was anointed. He said nothing about spiritual gifts, the power of God, looking for somebody who's charismatic. He said nothing about looking for somebody who's talented, right? In fact, almost every single thing he mentioned had to do with their character, had to do with their character, right? The only thing that he was even close to a gift or a talent, he said able to teach. But even then, you have to prepare to teach. Even then, you have to have the right heart to teach, Right. And teach for the right motives if you're going to, you know, follow God and his plan. But notice what he said in Second Timothy 3.12. He said, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. What does that mean? Well, blameless means having a good reputation. The husband of one wife refers to sexual purity and integrity. Not somebody who's running around, not somebody who's doing that. <coughs> right. He said sexually pure. You know, there was a man that uh, come, he came to our church, you know, years ago, and, and he had a lot of issues in his life, and that's the people we love. We want to help them grow. We want to help them be restored and forgiven and cleansed and find their purpose and things. And, and so he had a past, and we were working with him to try to, 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 to become like Christ, develop his character. But he had some issues with lust. He had some issues with um, his sexuality. And so he, he would have sex with some different women, and things like that. And one time, I remember specifically, he came to me and he said, you know, Pastor, hey, I went to a bar, I had some drinks, and I woke up the next one, and I woke up the next morning in the bed with a woman, right? Well, almost like he was presenting this, like, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> really? I think we all know how that happened, right? Well, anyway, as we were trying to help this man, he didn't want the help. He enjoyed his lifestyle. You know, he's kind of in that valley and Satan was tugging on his heart. It's really sad because you see he had great potential, but he just didn't want to deal with himself and allow God to heal him and use him the way he wants to. So this man ended up getting upset and he ended up leaving the church. Well, he went to another church and he was instantly put in the leadership position. And so then he talked to one of our members and says, well, you know, when I was at this, our church, I couldn't buy a leadership position is what he said. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, our leadership positions are not for sale, <laughs> number one. Number two, we don't put people in positions of leadership who go to the club, get drunk, and wake up in the bed with a woman that's not their wife. <laughs> that's just the facts, right? But here's the deal. As long as those things have a hold on him, he's never going to fulfill his purpose. 
He's never, his, his, his call is never going to be maximized. His talents are never going to be used to the degree that they could, right? And God gives us space and time to repent, and God gives us time, and he wants, he works on a heart. He, I'm sure he's working on this man. I don't know what happened to this man, but I, 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 my heart's desire is for him to change and to become what God wants him to be, right? But the thing is, it's like Samson. If you don't deal with the things that are inside of you, then they will destroy you, right? And so God wants us to develop our character, right? Now, uh, and again, you, you may be, you know, joining our service today and you say, well, I've had these things in my past. I've had, look, that's who God uses. All of us have a past. The Bible says in, in Corinthians that, hey, such were some of you, you were drunk, you were thieves, you were covetous, you were fornicators, but you've been washed, you've been saved, you've been called. There's a difference between somebody that's got a past who repented and is working on it and becoming like Christ and doing what God wants them to do. That is the person that God will use and they'll fulfill their purpose and they won't be snared by the devil and by the flesh. Amen. All right, so he goes on, talks about other things. He talks about in this passage in 1 Timothy, being temperate. What does that mean? Self-control, right? Well, self-control is important in relationships. Self-control is important in ministry. Self-control is important in life, right? And we've all experienced people that are not self-controlled. He says sober-minded. What does that mean? A clear thinker, right? A clear thinker. They're able to think soberly and clear about things. Then it says of good behavior, good behavior. Uh, you know, I knew a pastor and he had a man come to his church and the guy was an, just a gifted speaker. I mean, he knew the word. He was a gifted speaker. And so he would walk up to the pastor all the time, you know, and he said, hey, pastor, when you're out of town, I can take the pulpit for you. I can preach for you. I can do this kind of thing. You know, it's amazing that he offered to volunteer to preach, but he never offered, volunteered to usher or to help or to serve or to clean. But hey, if you got a pulpit position, I can do that, right? Well, the man was gifted in those areas, but uh, this pastor, being a wise pastor, um, he monitored the man for a while because he didn't know the man, right? And the Bible says, let the elders first be proved, right? That means examined, you know? And so we, over time, the pastor noticed that this man was very ugly and condescending to his wife to the point where the wife had been in tears based on the things that the husband had said to her on multiple occasions. And so thankfully, this man, this pastor, never put this man in a position to minister the word because his character disqualified him. People don't like to hear that. But listen, if you, if you can't love your wife as Christ loves the church, then why should I put you in position to influence a lot of other people? That's the reality. How about work on yourself? How about loving your wife? And then you can be used by God. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Character is so important. It can disqualify you from kingdom use, right? The Bible goes on and talks about a lot of other things. It talks about being hospitable. Right? How many of you know we're supposed to be hospitable, not a hermit? We're supposed to be able to teach, right? Now, what does that mean? Share, everybody's, can, everybody's not called to be a teacher in the body of Christ, but everybody can teach, right? So that's just sharing things that you know. And then not a drunk, not violent, not greedy for money, right? In other words, God, God has given us resources to use for the kingdom of, of God, and God's not opposed to us having money. He just don't want money to have us. And sometimes, care, if we don't work on our character, greed can come in. Being covetous can come in. And 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 says, But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them, listen to this, that plunge them into ruin and destruction. What plunged them into ruin and destruction? Greed. Greed, right? See, there's a healthy desire to prosper. There's a healthy desire. God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. So if we're desiring to be blessed, if we're desiring to increase so that we can bless people, so that we can bless the kingdom of God, so that we can bless our family, so that we can do things for God, we can advance kingdom uh, business with kingdom resources, then that's great. But what we're talking about is people become greedy for themselves. They're not interested in anything else. 
they're interested in themselves. You know, Jesus told a parable. He said it was a certain man and he prospered. And he says, I've got all these goods for myself and my barns and I'm going to store my stuff and it's all mine and I'm going to have my stuff for years. And then God came to him and said, you fool. You were rich for yourself, not rich for others, not rich for God. See, God's not opposed to us being rich for others and for the kingdom. But he does not want us to be covetous. He does not want us to be greedy, right? And so we can see illustrate. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not greedy. Well, uh, I'm not covetous. I'm not greedy. Well, do you tithe? Do you give? Right? You know, the, the Bible talks about tithing in Malachi chapter 3. It says, will a man rob God? Well, if you're robbing God, then you're greedy. You're covetous. You're taking what belongs to God. The Bible says the tithe is his. So if I take that tithe, I'm greedy. I'm covetous. I'm taking what belongs to somebody else. I mean, we think about it in the world. If I went and saw somebody walking down the street and I said, hey, give me your wallet. And I try to take their wallet. Right? That's stealing. Well, God says when we don't tithe, when we fail to tithe, we're stealing from God. Robbing, robbing God is what the Bible says. And see, people want to be used. People want to flow in the anointing. People want to be gifted. and People want to use, be flowing in spiritual gifts, but they don't even tithe. You know, why should God trust you with a greater anointing if he can't even trust you with money, right? That's what we're talking about. See, money can qualify us for greater use in the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. Money and the proper handling of money and the proper heart toward money can position us and put us in position to be used in greater ways in the kingdom of God. But mishandling money can disqualify us from position and use in the kingdom of God. That's why we're talking about character, right? <clears throat> and so it talks about <clears throat> uh, 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5 in the new century. It says, uh, talking about leaders again, it says, he must be a good family leader, having children who cooperate with full respect. Now we know that all children, none of us operate with full respect all the time. We may want to. But what's he talking about is that we are, we are diligent in developing our kids and helping them grow. We're loving our family. We're developing them. We're investing in them. We're not only teaching and training, we're correcting, right? And doing the things necessary to help them grow. Loving on our family like God does us, right? Um, that means that we, we're there to coach, to discipline, to help, right? And so <clears throat> what... What does God want for us then? When we're talking about all these things and kind of bringing it down, Timothy showed us all these different characteristics that we want to develop. But what is God saying? He's saying, I want you to develop your character. I want you to become like Christ. I want you to get rid of the things that are of this world and of the enemy. And I want you to develop the things that are of me. Honesty, truth, uh, truthfulness, uh, being generous, right? Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control. God wants us to develop these character traits. So now, how do we develop these character traits? How do we do it? Well, first of all, you have to be honest with yourself. You can't fix a problem you don't have. If you're unwilling to admit something, you can never work on it, right? And so be honest with yourself and then see God about the areas you need to work on. One of the fastest prayers that God will ever answer in your life is one when you say to God, God, what do I need to work on? <laughs> and there's a biblical verse for that. Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. David said, search me, O God, and point out anything in me that offends you and lead me in the path everlasting. What's he saying? Point out anything in me that I need to eradicate and help me integrate everything of you that I need to integrate into my life. All right? And then ask those who are over you in the Lord or close to you and love you uh, to help you see areas of your life that you need to work on. But don't get angry. Don't say, hey, do you see anything with me? And then they tell you something, and you're like, what? I don't do that. What are you talking about? Well, you know you didn't. No, don't do any of that. Say thank you. <laughs> thank you, right? And then pray for transformation. Pray as power to what we're doing, right? Prayer with the power of God. See, character development is a work between you and God. It's not all God. As we talked about earlier, you can't lay hands on it and say, oh, it's fixed, my character's fixed. No, there's a work you have to do to renew your mind, discipline the flesh, integrate good characteristics in your life. But it's not all you either. 
It's, it, Pastor Hagen used to say this, when the natural and the supernatural come together, they make an explosive force for God. That's what we're talking about. You put the natural work in and you believe God for the supernatural work and your character will be transformed and you will fulfill your purpose. You will fulfill your destiny and you'll become what God wants you to become. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you for the transforming power of your word. We thank you, Father, that you uh, love us, that you've called us, you've equipped us, you've gifted us. And Father, help us see areas of our life where our character needs to be developed. We thank you, Father. We commit this day, Father, to get rid of any negative character traits and to integrate your character into our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control, generosity, all your character traits, Lord. Help us develop. Help us grow. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're gathering with us today and you're not sure if you were to die today, I tell you what, there's good news. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so I tell you, it's really simple. God made it really simple for us to have eternal life and to have a relationship with him. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and we confess him as our Lord and Savior, we will be saved. So if you're not sure if you're to die today or maybe you're, you're joining us and you say, Pastor, you know, hey, I did my own thing and I need to recommit my life today to Christ. Hey, you can join this prayer as well. Uh, I'm going to pray you repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I confess him now as my Lord and Savior. And I commit this day to love you, to serve you, and to pursue you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, first of all, I want you to know that we are so excited for you. The angels of heaven are rejoicing. We ask you to go to our website at AbundantChurch.org, A-B-U-N-D-A-N-T-C-H-U-R-C-H.org. There's a contact button. Click that contact button. Let us know, hey, I received Christ. Hey, I rededicated my life. We want to rejoice with you. Also, it's investment time into the kingdom of God. I'll tell you what, our mission at Abundant Life, our mission is to lead people to a committed relationship with Jesus. That means reaching people for the kingdom of God and helping them grow, helping them develop, helping their character grow. Amen? And I tell you what, when you give, when you tithe, the Bible says God will open the windows of heaven. When you give your seed or sow your offering, God says that that seed planted into the kingdom and God will cause a harvest to come back into your life. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given. Good measure, press down, shaken together and run it over will men give into your bosom. There's different ways you can give. You can mail it in to our address, uh, which is P.O. Box 80260, P.O. Box 80260, uh, Fort Worth, Texas 76244. That's Fort Worth, Texas 76244. Uh, you can also, the easy way to do it is go right to our website at AbundantChurch.org, A-B-U-N-D-A-N-T-C-H-U-R-C-H. Dot org and there's a give icon you can click that give icon um, and follow the prompts it's safe simple easy to use but however you give thank you for your faithful and consistent giving that empowers us to minister the word of god and help change lives not only here in fort worth but around the world thank you for your partnership amen let me pray for you now father i thank you and praise you for supernatural increase we thank you lord for the privilege we have to give and to partner with you in changing lives and Father, we thank you, Lord, as we tithe, you open the windows of heaven. As we give, you pour out abundant blessings on our jobs, our businesses, our finances. Thank you that debts are canceled. Thank you for increase coming our way. Thank you for blessing us and making us a blessing. And Father, we thank you for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Finally, want you to know that Pastor Samantha and I love you so very much. We pray for you often. We thank God for you. And I tell you, we count it an honor every time we get to share the word of God with you. And until we're able to do that again, please know we love you and God bless you.